Thanks for inviting me here. I haven't got a mic because there's, there's, there's thousands of people got a mic because we're being videoed, so that's, that's why. Um, yeah, I suppose a lot of people um, come to my studio and, and they often say, oh God, you're, you're, you're really lucky. You're really lucky because you kind of work with all these artists and you can kind of do exactly what you want and it's like really fun. And because it's sort of often, it often can be that. And I suppose um, my sort of take on that is that it's about the work that for, with a graphic designer within a kind of artist institution is you've got to kind of get inside uh, the mind of the artist or the institution and kind of give a feeling of, I call it emotion. It's like an emotion. So it's, it's, it's obviously, we all have particular ideas and as a graphic designer, you can be very creative, but essentially you have to give off a certain feeling. And that is ultimately the trick, I believe. And I call it an emotion, so it's a feeling. You know, even this typeface there has got some kind of feeling that you can kind of think about and sort of says something. And I've sort of like tried to break down what these emotions are, you know, in probably three quarters of an hour, because I know it's a really nice evening outside and we all want to go and sit in the park. So do I. So um, one emotion I, I feel is really important is this idea of being nearly boring. You know, I often describe my work as nearly boring. You know, again, don't confuse that for really boring. Some people do. But, you know, this is a poster that we made for Art on the Underground, which is uh, an art program you might be aware of. That uh, it's the art program for the Tube. They do an amazing program. This poster is, like, nearly boring. It's nearly boring. There's so little on it. And as you can see, it's black and white. There's not much going on. And all I'm really doing here is playing on the type. You know, this is a project by Anna Barrable, who maybe has shown at Modern Oxford. She must have done it in her time. In, maybe, not sure. Uh, and all I'm doing is using the typography to actually make a poster that stands out more actually by making a poster that's nearly boring. So when you saw these on the tube, this was maybe about seven or eight years ago, uh, they really kind of stood out because they were so basic, as if some, no one had designed them. Again, you know, we're talking about kaleidoscope in a, in a, in a, in a while, but something that's very important to me to do with this emotion is, is, is this arrangement is how to arrange things on a page or on a screen or on an exhibition or on a bus. And you know, this is actually uh, the work of Jan Chikold, who's the great typographer. This is from his book, Denoy Typography, 1935. And he kind of like proclaimed this notion of symmetry is over and uh, asymmetric or dynamic arrangements um, is, the, is the new, I suppose it's modernism. So this is sort of a kind of his ideas of how to kind of lay out areas of text. And I often look at this and I'm thinking, how can you be dynamic rather than having it all to the left or all centered or all right? You can use these kind of ideas that he kind of shows here. Again, this is another great arrangement. Oh, this, this is a, this is, it's not really a piece of graphic design. It's a, it's a piece of concrete poetry by Bob Cobbin. I think it's done in the 80s. And to me, this is brilliant because it works on three levels. It works, the first level is, it's a poem. This is a square poem. This poem is a square, so on and so on. The other level it works on is it works on the level of language. And if you look at this long enough, you'll probably realise that every line has got the same words in it, but reconfigured, so they make sense. For example, you know, this is a poem square, this is a square poem. And then the third thing, which is kind of like the Holy Trinity, which is something that I'm always trying to get into my work, sort of different things going on, 
is it's a square. And to me, when you realise that, it's like really strong. So it's poetry, it's language, it makes sense, and it's a square. And it's all to do with the arrangement. Actually, the design of this is actually really bad. If I showed this to my professors and I uh, learned just down the road at Reading, in the typography department at Reading University, if I had just done this in the department, they would have said, all these spaces are really bad and you shouldn't do that. But he's done that, Bob Cobbin, because he wanted to make it a square. Again, you know, other things about arrangements. This is a book that we made uh, for the Adelaide, the Adelaide Festival uh, a couple of years ago. And again, you know, I get very excited uh, when I hear the word footnotes, footnotes in a publication. How to deal with footnotes? Where should they go? Should they go at the top, the bottom, the side, the front, the back, at the end of the essay, the end of the book? Here, because this show was about worlds in collision, about things colliding, I just thought it'd be brilliant for the footnotes just to kind of collide around the page and just like start where they start and then go upside down if they just run out of space. It's all about the arrangement. The rest is kind of quite normal. Here, um, this is another little publication we made uh, for an artist called Kathy Haynes. And it was a project that she created essentially to do with time. So an idea of arranging time is that, again, the, the book kind of designs itself because where one line ends, another line starts. So you can see that the, the breaks, the paragraph breaks, are determined by the, the paragraph before. Other things that I like to think about when I'm talking about emotion within graphic design is this idea of a picture puzzle. Is this idea of, and it's something I know that we talk a lot about in modern art, legibility and puzzles. And is it good that people can read something or is it good that they need to work it out? And where's the border? Where's the boundary? Where's the boundary between that? You know, here is a cover I made um, for the artist Fabian Peak. And can people read that? Loose monk. Loose monk. Yeah, loose monk. So what's going on here is a kind of bit of a puzzle, right? It's a bit of a puzzle. And the reason it's designed like that is because, well, for a start, it was concrete poetry. That's one reason. The second reason why, was that it was the, the, the title came from, I think it's Thessalonius Monk, who was a jazz musician. So it's a little bit jazzy, it's a little bit piano y. And it's this idea that a cover you know, would sell a book, and if you can't quite read it, you'd still be kind of interested enough to try and read it. Here's another book cover. Can anyone work out what's going on with this cover? UK geography. It's the UK, it's the UK geography, yes, it's the UK geography. I think I want to show you this slide in uh, Japan and everyone just looked at me as if I was like totally weird because they couldn't work it out. But yeah, it's, it's a map of the British Isles, but it's abstract. So this is a book cover uh, of uh, writing about a sense of place. So it's people writing about specific places in the UK. And again, it's the idea that where they're writing is marked on the page, which becomes the, um, the front cover. And again, you know, one of our clients' comments was, just before it was going to print, they actually said, oh, can you just put like a map of the British Isles around it? Because then people will get it more. And I kind of agree with them. They will get it more, but it would then be too obvious. So it's playing. So a lot of designers' role is playing on that, that kind of tension. Picture puzzle. Pastiche. Pastiche is something that... As a studio, we can do quite a lot of. And again, with pastiche, it's, it's, it's essentially taking a style or a form from a period 
a graphic style and pastiching it, sort of, I suppose, copying it in a way. And here, this is a poster I made uh, with Jeremy, with Jeremy Della. And uh, this was a show that we actually did together where we took his uh, Venice Biennale show from 2013 called English Magic and we graphically remixed it. So again, you get the idea here. It looks like a 1994 rave flyer that people would put on their wall. And people often think pastiche is very easy. You just kind of get something and you just kind of copy it. But actually, to do it properly is really, really super difficult difficult because you've got to kind of get all the details right. You've got to choose a really naff typeface that is just naff enough to then bend and you know it's actually it's actually a lot more in it than just copying something. You know here is another pastiche that we made for the same show. This is a pastiche of a of kind of a, a Russian banknote that's got like Roman Abranovich in the middle. It's got a kind of lyrics from uh, Depeche Mode in the text, and then it's got all the kind of dodgy oil companies that he owns uh, as the kind of currency. And I suppose, again, the reason I'm showing this is because this is really about a sort of printing process pastiche. So again, you know, obviously we do work you know, on, on, on computers, but sometimes things have to go through a printing process to make them look authentic. So this would have been printed, scanned, reprinted, risographed and then scanned in again to kind of get everything on the same kind of evenness. Again, here's another one, just a kind of sort of pastiche of a bit of a kind of observer birds, kind of uh, to do with rich people's yachts. Other things that, you know, part of our work, part of our design work, is this idea of mixing things up. Again, I kind of think that maybe it's too easy now, it's too easy to choose a font that you, I don't know, download from the internet and then just use one font. I kind of think a graphic designer has to do a bit more. And this is a bit of a story. This is a uh, a sort of process that we went through to, to get to, to explore this mixing thing. So it starts off actually in letterpress. This is a letterpress invite that I made for uh, The Approach, which is an art gallery in London. And um, we used a, a printing process called letterpress, which is like lots of little letters all lined up together, printed. It's how printing was until yeah, the mid-60s. Um, and I always wanted to use, like, Universe in letterpress. Universe is a typeface, and it existed in letterpress, and it's very beautiful, very different to the digital one. So I asked the, the, the printer to set it in Universe, and he sent this back, and he said, Fraser, uh, there aren't enough L's it's supposed to be Philip Allen. So you put in X's just to say there aren't enough L's. Because if you haven't got an L, you just haven't got an L. You can't do anything about it. It's just that's the way it is. So he kind of said, well, I first he said, well, that's brilliant. Should we just do that? Sent it to the client. Of course, part of a designer's job is you have to get everything approved. Sent it to the client. And I said, isn't it genius? There aren't enough L's, so we've replaced them with X's. And he said, yeah, but his name's Philip Allen. So, no, it's not, actually. So we have to take that on board. And our printer said, well, okay, I could do it in bold. You can do it in bold. I've got bold, got enough L's. But I have this theory that you don't need to do two levels of change. So, you know, for example, I'm going from uppercase to lowercase. That's a level, that's a differentiation. I don't need to go from uppercase to lowercase and bold. It's too much. So then he said, oh, but I've got another font called Monotype Grotesque. We can use that for the capitals. Here it is. So I kind of said, brilliant. That's brilliant. I love it. And that was the invite. So it's a subtle shift where you would argue that not many people would know. But emotionally and subtly, there's something going on. 
you look at your kaleidoscope printed matter, you'll probably notice there's something going on. So that was the invite. Then, uh, maybe a few months later, we were digitalizing this amazing font, which is designed by Edward Wright from the 60s, British uh, artist, teacher, not really a type designer, but British, uh, you would say, letterer. And because we weren't very good at designing typefaces, uh, and this typeface only exists in uppercase, when we sort of half digitalized it and started using it, we kind of like, you know, bodged it into another font and it kind of started coming out a bit like this. So the uppercase would be the Edward Wright and the lowercase would just be like Arial, just by default because we actually hadn't got a lowercase. And to me, that just started to kind of look quite amazing, the idea of mixing a capital and a lowercase. And again, here you've got Edward Wright, here you've got Ariel. Then we're matching the, what you call this, the stem, uh, stem width. So we're matching that stem width with that stem width. And then, again, I suppose, you know, like all graphic designers, you kind of get into something and you start to sort of push your boundaries of what's possible. So here I thought, well, let's do it again, but let's do it with a serif font. This is for another job where we thought we'd mix sort of really unlikely, horrible combinations, which is this disgusting font called uh, Copper Plate Gothic. Have you ever heard of that? It's on everyone's Mac, I think. It's kind of like cheap solicitors use it to try and look, look fancy. Uh, but we use it for the capitals, then we use uh, Fornia for the uh, lowercase, and we create this new typeface. You can see it a bit closer up. It looks pretty normal, really. I know you're probably all sitting there thinking, well, that just looks normal. But to me, it's very different. Emotionally, it's just subtly different. And then um, we started thinking, OK, we've, got, we've done uppercase and lowercase. What's next? The thing that's next is what would happen if every letter was different? So for example, there are many typefaces, as you know, in the world, and a lot of them are very similar. So you might argue, what's the difference between Helvetica and Arial? Not much. Why would you choose one over the other? It's difficult, right? So my thought for this font is, let's just choose them all and mix them all up. So this is Helvetica, this is Arial, this is Venus, this is Universe, this is something else. So each letter is a different typeface, but they're aligned to the X height, which is, this is called the X height. So they're aligned, so they look kind of similar, but you get this kind of flicker, and you get this kind of idea that something's going on, the mix. Obviously, when you try and find out what font it is by uploading it to my fonts, which you can do in any typeface, it comes back with an error, which I always thought was quite funny. So here it is, and again, it's subtle. It's very subtle. But you can see that the typeface, it's almost like type design without type design, without actually designing types, just combining type. Another project, we kind of moved it on even further. This was for William uh, Burroughs. And here, I kind of thought, okay, we've done the one where A is Helvetica and B is Aerial. What would happen? Is it possible? Is it technically possible that each time you type in a letter, it's actually a different letter? So we managed to figure that out with a bit of programming. So each time you type in an R, it's a different R. Different R. Each time you type in an E, it's a different E. So again, you get this kind of uh, mix up. Each time you type in an apostrophe, you get a different apostrophe. But they're all from the same group. This is called Century Schoolbook. The typeface family is called Century Schoolbook. We started calling it mega font, kind of many fonts. Again, graphic design can be subtle, super subtle. 
difficult to see at this stage, but we made a, a book with a brilliant Australian artist called Sean Gladwell, and he did a lot of work with motorbikes. And I thought it'd just be really funny to change all the full stops to motorcycle helmets. Can you see? Subtle, right? But it's there. So I guess sometimes you have to do things for your own amusement. Even did an ellipse, so they go together. It's quite interesting to try and see it at 10 point in a book. You can see it. Okay, patterns. Again, you know, I thought I could, up until maybe two or three years ago, I thought I could solve every design brief typographically. Until really this one, actually, which was actually the Lovers Enough show here, Modern Oxford. Maybe some of you saw it. And it was just this notion of, could you make patterns? So it was a show... Uh, Andy Warhol and William Morris, a joint exhibition. Obviously, they weren't ever together at the same time, but it was a conceptual, <coughs> brilliant exhibition, actually, amazing. And we, we had to come up with some kind of identity <coughs> that can be used in this day and, work, day and age. You know, an identity has to be used online for mail-outs, for vinyls, for all sorts of things. So, again, I thought I could do it typographically. Amazingly, we did a bit of research... You know, we found Andy Warhol's letterhead. We also found out that he made lecture set from his mum's handwriting. Did you know that? On the right, that's his mum's handwriting lecture set. You know, again, they shared things in common, Andy Warhol. Uh, they both designed typefaces. This is a um, sort of golden cockerel type from William Morris. They both designed patterns. They both made books. You know, the, the show was actually taken from a William Morris book. But there's an Andy Warhol book on the right. So again, we thought, could we do this typographically? Could we, could we make a font or could we combine things? Could we, you know, could we somehow, one time it's Andy Warhol's studio letterhead, Andy Warhol's mum's handwriting, William Morris's lettering, and then could we sort of combine it all together? And we kind of thought, oh, it's going to look amazing. But actually, we had to kind of realise by, you know, me sending it around that it doesn't work, really. It just looks rubbish. And sometimes you have to really... Um, you have to really take that on board. You have to go, actually, it's not working. So, again, we thought, could we do patterns? Again, so this is an Andy Warhol pattern. This camouflage series. Uh, it's a William Morris wallpaper. So, actually, what we decided to do is to try to sort of take these things apart. So, could we, could we take apart Andy Warhol, take apart William Morris, so they're sort of elements of layers, and combine them together? So, these are actually the... Uh, eight layers of how to make that wallpaper uh, by William Morris. So we thought, could we combine everything together? And we were doing it all by hand, and sometimes they were a bit too warholy, or they were a bit too a bit too Morrissey. And and I think that the whole thing about this project, and it, again, the job of a graphic designer is here. We weren't. We were trying to like copy them. So it's a bit lame, really. It's like, well, this looks just bad, right? Whereas we didn't want to copy them. We wanted to create something new from them. So again, but you have to kind of just try. Sometimes they just look a bit too jungle. You know, it's kind of nice, but it's sort of a bit, a bit jungle. Or that one's a bit cornfield. Or that one's just too Morrissey. So we kind of painstakingly redrew in Illustrator, um, Morris, one of Morris's patterns, sort of started taking it apart. Again, painstakingly drew Andy Warhol's pattern. It's actually a real nightmare trying to draw track camouflage. You think it's really easy, but it's totally complicated. <laughs> Take them apart and kind of like started overlaying them. 
So we sort of worked out that oh, Andy Warhol's pattern was square. William Morris's wallpaper was rectangular. So every time you overlaid them, you'd always get a new pattern because one was square and one was rectangle. So you'd always get something new. And that's kind of exciting. So we immediately got to this kind of realization that you could create all sorts of patterns just from these elements. And again, that just became, I think it's struggling because it's like a huge vector file, the basis of you know, a campaign, an identity that we could simply put over overlay, a very simple typeface that was designed by, well, was a monotype version, monotypes of type foundry, of a William Morris revival. So it wasn't a William Morris typeface, it was a, it was a version of, of a William Morris typeface. But again, the rest is quite easy, quite simple. And you know, train gates is something that I've always wanted to do, sort of fulfilled my ambition. These are actually train gates at Paddington. But you can see it kind of works and it brands something through colour. Leggings was another huge ambition that is yet to be realised. Image treatment. Again, how you treat images is super important as a designer. And again, in today's world of, of images king, or images are everywhere, it's like, do you just get an image and plonk it on? Like you could, sometimes you have to do something with it as a designer. So here we have a person. Can anyone describe the characteristics of this person? Like what's the first emotion you feel? What's the first thing that comes into your head when you see this guy? Serious. Serious. Boring. Straight. Anything else? Refreshed emotion. Yeah. Not cool. <laughs> Basically, yeah. We're agreed on that. It's not a relative of mine, so don't worry. You can be as horrible as you want. Um, wow. He's really cool now, right? He's like a, the member of Craftwork. And he might even make it onto a book cover. So suddenly, it's gone from being like really uncool. This was a slide, uh, a negative slide that I bought in, a, in an old uh, Dalston Waste Market in London. And transparencies used to be the wrong way around. And I just thought it was really amazing. And it made it onto a book cover uh, of a book published by Bookworks, written by Stuart Home. So again, that graphic design is all about how you treat the image. The rest is kind of just there. The type's not really doing much. It's just, it's all about the image treatment. Oh yeah, this is my new slide, which I'm getting into at the moment, which is drawing in, uh, just in Illustrator, just by hand. It looks a bit sort of naive, but it's, it's my new kind of uh, branding. So now we're talking about branding, motion of branding. Again, we're talking about kaleidoscope. I think Emma mentioned early that, again, the brief was uh, to create something that could be used throughout the year that could change, that could evolve, but that kind of sums up maybe what this gallery is all about. And SolarWit had two shows here, one show, or one. And, you know, this, this sort of way of, this, well, this illustration really was a kind of starting point or one of the starting points of, of thinking about what we could do for Kaleidoscope. And actually, we started work on the pattern before the show was called Kaleidoscope. So the show was going to be called, well, we didn't know, actually. It was just going to be called, I can't remember. I'm sure it will come. Uh, sorry? We didn't know. So the brief was make a pattern, but we don't know what it's called yet. So, you know, again, there is a logo for Modern Art Oxford, and we just thought we'd cut it up. So, again, you cut it up, 
what do you get? You get a cut-up logo. But, you know, what can you do with that? You know, we started thinking about ornaments and patterns, and we thought, could we do an ornament? You know, this was you know, these beautiful ornaments that, that were used to kind of decorate books. We thought, could we make some sort of modern art ornaments? These are still really cool, actually. This was almost our first proposal. They look kind of modern, but they also look a bit old. But I guess the problem with them is like, they're brilliant, but it's like, what do you do with them? So we made 50 ornaments out of 50 bits of the modern art Oxford logo. Can you spin them round? Can you? you know, they're very, very nice. Maybe we should resurrect them for something. You know, some early sketches. Maybe it was going to be called Modern Art Oxford 50 years. So that's probably what we had to go on. But it all looked a bit old. It looked a bit kind of... It didn't really look that sort of forward thinking. It was a bit like, well, it's very nice, but it's a bit... Maybe it's a bit kind of... Uh, it's a bit sort of backward rather than, I think, the vision for the gallery is to go forward. It's not to go completely back. It's to celebrate what you have, to move it forward. And then I think, you know, this notion of maybe kaleidoscope came in. So we, we kind of took the same patterns, and this is maybe how it would work on a poster. We thought, could we colour them? Kind of interesting patterns. Combining them. But then as soon as the show became kaleidoscope, it became much more obvious that obviously you could do some kind of kaleidoscope pattern with this 50 years cut up idea. And essentially uh, that's how we kind of got to this place. So it's creating something that's energetic, that's interesting, that maybe is slightly, you know, but sometimes it's a bit sort of psychedelic. Sometimes it's a bit kind of stained glass. I love this one, it's sort of gone a bit sort of stained glass. Sometimes it looks like uh, doilies, sometimes it looks like uh, snowflakes, sometimes it looks like magic eyes. And I think that's really good that essentially you can create all these different effects essentially from the same thing using colour and how you combine the kaleidoscope. These are some sort of early mug proposals. I don't think we ever did a pencil, but we should have done, because that would have been a good pencil. There's still time. And again, you know, this was the sort of like the final one that we kind of got to after a lot of work. Just this idea that essentially it's the same Sort of same arrangement, but depending on how you combine the kaleidoscope, you get a super different effect. You know, the sort of stained glass one, the icy one. I totally love this one. This one's like somehow got like three shapes in it. And it's again, it's not, it's not through accident, it's through doing lots and lots and lots in our studio, lots and lots and lots of different versions and trying to kind of filter it down. Another feeling, so I know I'm sort of skipping on a little bit, but I'm getting through everything, is to use text as an image. Again, pretty much like Kaleidoscopes does, but in a sort of slightly different way here. Again, something that I worked on with an artist called Giorgio Sodotti. Uh, he's a brilliant artist. Uh, kind of came up with this idea of you know, what would happen if you just chopped a typeface in half? So the typeface we chopped in half was called Swiss, and we split it. So the typeface called Split Swiss. So obviously when you split an S and then put a, join it with another S, you get an S. And you get some really interesting effects. 
Again, they become quite sculptural. This one looks a bit like an upside down book on a habitat table. That one looks a bit like a kind of play button. Again, you've got an upside down book on a Muji table on the right. And again, it's just all by accident. That's just an A over an E. You can even write with it. It's a very space saving typeface. It uses half the space of any other typeface. Save you lots of money on printing. Only problem is you can't read it. Amazingly, a gallery used it for their identity. No show space. We made them a sign. It's a little gallery in London. Okay, another way to make graphic design is to use process. Again, that's something that you know I'm I'm sort of very much into is this idea of how is something printed and how can the print affect, how can the, the visual, I suppose the visual appearance of something be made through printing. How cool is that? It's a photocopier stroke printer with a handle on it. So when I saw this, I was like, oh my God, what kind of machine is that? Is it a photocopier that you can hand print? It turns out that it's a, it's a, well, it's a, it's a, um, it's a form of stencil duplication. Again, there's a big kind of phase or a way of people doing a lot of self-publishing at the moment on these things called risographs. This is a sort of type of risograph, but it's from China. And it's a way of hand making or self-making uh, lots of copies of one thing rather than a digital printer. Uh, you would make a stencil and then you would squeeze the ink through a stencil and and you can do it either by electricity or by hand. And I thought, well, I've got to get one of these machines. So again, it was very difficult to actually obtain it because when I got it from China, they kept on trying to sell me the one without the handle because they were saying, well, why do you need the handle? Because it's going to be in England and the handle is because its, it's main use is actually for... Um, to be sold to Africa where there's a power problem. So if the power goes down, they can just carry on by hand. So that was difficult. Other thing of my interest in typography is obviously uh, this idea of stencils. The idea of actually, rather than digital stencil font, is, is a physical stencil font. So this, I have a big collection of stencils. And you know, I was just curious about, could I do something with a stencil stencils and a stencil duplicator, could I somehow combine the two? So okay, here you'll see some sort of lines, some dots actually. So I thought, okay, the, the forms themselves are pretty boring, uh, but when you put them together and draw the letter, so rather than drawing the A and the A, what I did was put the two together and just drew through both of them. So that's actually done by hand. So I get this kind of really interesting new font that you can't really read. But you can sort of see that it's a typeface. And this became the sort of basis of a show, actually, that, that was at the Whitechapel Gallery, uh, would have been about two years ago now. So here you have the, the letters on the wall, and also presenting the show, very much part of it is the machine that's used to to make those letters. And again, you sort of celebrate the, the roughness and the process. So you get this kind of really sort of bad quality print. That again, takes quite a lot of time to achieve. You definitely don't just press print and it comes out. You kind of have to really work at it. And I really enjoy that as a process. This was another amazing thing. This is a, a lettering guide. Anyone ever seen these before? They're kind of similar to the ones that you would get to draw as a kid, 
But what's really interesting about this one is that you're not drawing and filling it in. To draw an A, you draw this, and then you, you get this sort of machine. You just pull it back, and then you draw that. So the A is made up of that, shift over, that. The B is made up of that and that. Can you see? So it's like super clever. Actually, the typeface that you draw when you do it is pretty boring. It's just a font. But I'm just super excited by this. Sort of almost like taking a step backwards. So again, you know, this is what happens if you put them together. You kind of get something maybe a bit like this. Again, something that I really got into is these sort of small printing machines. Uh, these are called spirit duplicators. They were quite sort of popular, I think, in the UK, maybe in the 60s and 70s with school teachers. And they would use a kind of white spirit method and a kind of carbon paper method to print your kind of lesson plan. Has anyone ever seen them before? Yeah, my mum was a teacher. She had one. She, it's called a banda machine. Yeah, a banda. And everything came out purple. Yeah, exactly. And it had a funny smell. Exactly. And it was all handwritten. And exactly. Wrote all the exercise sheets and yeah. they printed them. Exactly. She still got it? No, it was at school. All right. Yeah, it didn't go to her. Yeah. Okay, because I'm quite a fan of banda. But I found out that it's still really popular in um, Brazil. Brazilian eBay. They're called mimeographicos. Again, this is what I do in my <laughs> spare time. Well, not actually in my spare time. Um, and again, you know, working out how to use uh, these machines. So again, when it arrived, you know, I really didn't have a clue how to do it. All the instructions were in uh, Portuguese. So I had to sort of figure out via kind of lots of testing, lots of almost operating as a researcher, you know, how to make a stencil. I sort of actually weirdly worked out I could make a digital one through um, using a printout. And then I sort of suddenly came across these uh, tattoo transfers. I don't know if anyone's had a tattoo. I haven't. But... You kind of sometimes before they make a tattoo, they sort of transfer something onto your arm so you can see what it looks like. And they use a kind of stencil transfer. And I worked out if I bought a tattoo machine, I could do the same thing and then I could print it on the banding machine. So this is the kind of print effect you get, which is obviously purple or blue. And of course, everything smell of white spirit. But again, you create this kind of... Uh, texture, this feeling. Again, on the left, there's the sort of positive, and then on the right is the actual kind of master that you would print from. But again, they're very beautiful in themselves. They became part of, part of the show. That became the work, in a way. Uh, yeah, I think another thing in graphic design is to try and amuse people and amuse your audience. So I'm going to try and do that now. Let's see how it goes. So again, a book cover. This is the book cover for Bookworks, a series called Seminar. And uh, it was something that was a kind of slightly sort of sexual book. So again, it was very difficult to know what kind of images to put on or could it be done typographically. And I just thought, wouldn't it be really funny to put a bum on a cover? And a photocopied bum. And I suppose the sort of the act of putting a bum on a cover is such a cheap joke. But putting a bum on a cover and then turning it around, so it's not quite obviously a bum on a cover to start with, is maybe make it cheaper or make it not so obvious. And again, it raises up the question of whose bum is it? Again, these questions did come up at the meeting. 
I'm serious about copyright and what do we do about that? Because it is an internet bum, uh, it's a Google image bum and uh, the director of Bookworks said, well, the, whoever came forward and said, you put my bum on 2,000 books would have to prove it. That's the last slide. <laughs> We're going to end with the, the bum on a book. So thank you for listening. If people have questions, I'm going to awkwardly direct this mic at you. I know that was very whistle stop, so I kind of moved around a bit, but I sort of crammed a lot in, I think. What do you think about the idea um, about um, handwritten text coming back? Do you think it's quite a trend? Yeah. Um, yeah. 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 Well, I'm, I'm really into handwriting. Yeah. Uh, I think, uh, you know, handwriting's coming in for a few reasons. I guess it's that kind of personalization. Mm. Um, uh, the idea of, you know, everyone's got different handwriting. People don't know what even their partner or girlfriend or sister's handwriting is now. You always remember from years ago what your brother and sister's handwriting, but now you don't even know people that you work with, what their handwriting is like. Um, yeah, we do a lot of books where we often get the artist to handwrite the covers. Sometimes it's a kind of thing where you... It's always a good thing to try it. You know, we've probably done 20 books with handwritten covers of the artist, just like written. It's kind of a bit more interesting. You can actually amazingly get a, uh, this free software called, uh, if you Google turn your handwriting into a font.com, there, there are a few websites that you can uh, print out a grid, write in your handwriting, scan it in, upload it, and it will sort of chuck out a font for you of your handwriting. There's a font I use called Fraser, that's my like, handwriting. It's kind of slightly naive because obviously it's a digital version of a handwritten font, so it's a bit, it's actually a bit naff, but I'm quite into the naffness of it. What do you use that for? Do you send your emails in that font? Or? No, sometimes I like set serious text in it, <laughs> like academic text. In, I think I've used it in a couple of books once. Uh, my girlfriend wrote an essay in it once and published it in a magazine. Um, but no, I don't write, I don't use it for my emails because obviously they would have to have the font the other end for it to kind of come through. But yeah, that's what I kind so of... So it would only work if you print it out? It would only work if you print it out or send it as an image. Yeah. yeah. What age did you get into graphic design? Um, I got into graphic design when... Um, I was about 13. My next door neighbour was a graphic designer. And my mum asked me if I wanted to have some lessons in something or learn an instrument or something. And I said I really wanted to learn calligraphy because so I want to be a graphic designer. And uh, she arranged for uh, the sort of local, there was a local graphic designer to come round and do calligraphy lessons with me um, when I was like 13, 14. And that's how I, I always wanted to We've been fascinated by lettering, typefaces, and like spotting the difference between typefaces, trying to work out who designed them or what the font is, or why it's designed like that, or um, you know, it's kind of sort of how, how do people draw letters and type designs. There's a whole world of people drawing letters as new typefaces every day, thousands. Who's your hero graphic designer? Who did you look up to? Uh, there's many, really. There's many. Um, you know, people would argue Jan Chickold. I don't know if you know the work of Jan Chickold. It's, uh, he's a, he was a, was originally, I think he was German. Yeah, he was German, but he lived in uh, Switzerland for a long time after the war. He was the kind of master of typography. He went to, he actually came, I think after the war, he got a job as the head of Penguin, 
not the head of Penguin, the, the head graphic designer of Penguin, and he got paid more than the director of Penguin to sort out the, because the, the, Penguin needed to kind of rationalize its kind of system of specification of covers, and he just subtly kind of made things better. Um, and I suppose he sort of like thought of as the master. But I also am very much into artists uh, from a certain period of time, from the 60s and 70s, who made graphic design, who weren't very good. I'm actually sort of very much into that, sort of like, or artists that use design or typography. You know, there are many. Ed Ruscha was a graphic designer. Uh, Andy Warhol was a graphic designer. Barbara Kruger, who had a show here, was a graphic designer. So there's lots of artists that kind of like are on that kind of borderline between art and design and typography and language kind of thing. Who's your hero? Well, from, from you, I don't know many, but from what you're saying, Barbara Kruger, I sort of noticed, well, when I saw the Selfridges sale, <laughs> Yeah, of course. You know, thing, and I thought, oh, that's really cool. And then I started to look into it a bit more, and I realised it was taking the reference from her. So she took it from somewhere else. Oh, did she? No, I yeah. don't know about that. But <laughs> yeah, it's yeah, you, you, yeah. But that's um, yeah. I'm just wondering who who you would say is a graphic designer. But I mean, I don't look into graphic design much. But yeah, yeah, it's very really, um, interesting, and and. Um, and I was wondering um, about working with artists. Is it yeah. a bit of a nightmare sometimes? Because they've got such a strict vision and you're kind of creative person yourself and you've got this, not strict vision, but you know. Yeah. Yeah, I suppose it's, no, it's not a nightmare at all. It's, it's actually really, really, it's like a journey. Right. Um, and sometimes, you know, it depends who they are. And a lot of, you know, you'd say they have a strict vision, but actually they don't when it comes to mm. The design and sometimes you get involved in you know I showed some work like the Annabarable work was actually it wasn't really a poster it was actually the art we were making there mm. it wasn't a design it wasn't a design of a poster to go and see a show mm. like say you know come to kaleidoscope it was actually that was it the poster was the art mm. so that was very much a kind of like a sort of borderline close sort of scenario um, but no, that's, that is not a, it's not a nightmare, it's just it's a journey, it's a challenge and everyone's different and you have to be adaptable. So you might do one thing for one artist where you might do another thing for another artist. You just got to kind of get, remember or work out what they're trying to achieve through you because you're trying to sort of like, uh, you're trying to communicate their vision. So, yeah, sometimes that can be tricky, but that's, that's the job, that's the, char that's the challenge, that's the brief, right? Mm -hmm. You know, because as a designer, I probably feel that I don't, I don't have anything that I want to portray to the world. Mm -hmm. Like, I don't have any statements that I really want to make, but, mm -hmm. so I need, all designers need content. Mm -hmm. so, you, so you need to have something to, you, know, you need either text or images or a brief. Mm -hmm. So it's a different kind of mentality to maybe an artist. But I'm definitely like on the edge of those things. Like the, the process one was definitely when I was veering into a new world. Can I ask about your yes. studio and how that yes. went? So you've got Rachel and others and how authorship for you as a designer works when you're in the studio? Well, within the, all the people that work there or, or authorship of... of what we do for other people. Well, your work, uh, Fraser Muggeridge Studio, yeah. having an aspect which is recognisable mm -hmm. to an extent that's characteristic of authorship, let's say. Yeah. Um, and so, how does it work for the designers within that? Or how does that all play out? Well, they're very much part of a team, they're very much part of what we do. Um, you know, they would get a credit within a publication as the, the, the they've, that they've worked on. I suppose it's got my name on it as a studio, but really that's just a company name. It could be anything. It could be, you know, blah de blah but I suppose it is my name. Uh, authorship-wise, I suppose, yeah, I don't know. It's a tricky one, isn't it? 
We just played that in fashion and in art studios and lots of others. So yeah. I'm just curious as regards design. Yeah. Well, I suppose it's 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 Fraser Mugridge Studio, and that is definitely not just me. There is a brilliant team of five or six of us, so it's it's a kind of joint effort. Uh, I suppose I am involved in looking at everything that, that everyone does, so I'm sort of kind of uh, leading on it. But again, people's input definitely is super important. So, how do you go about selecting people, or some of the experimental approaches you describe, for example? Uh, people who are kind of in the same creative direction as you in the first place. Yeah, it's like any it's like any uh, it's like any operation, isn't it? Uh, finding good people to work with is uh, is challenged, and uh, you yeah. At the moment, we've got an amazing team, and um, yeah, not everyone can fit that team, and some people can, some people can't. It's it's sort of like it's like anything, isn't it? It's like working in an art gallery. Some people are on the same wavelength and some people aren't and and that's fine. It's not it's not a bad thing. We was gonna ask a question. Was I? <laughs> um, I can make one up. <coughs> Obviously when you're working with us it tends to be uh, the same process day in day out in terms of especially with kaleidoscope because it's five exhibitions, same pattern. When it comes to then redesigning an idea, let's say in 2017, how do you go about bringing your ideas to the gallery rather than just taking in the proposal itself? Sort of looking back at how Kaleidoscope started, because I, I was there, yeah. and I remember giving you that proposal of, I don't have a title, I don't really have any ideas, can you just make something up? Without losing your temper, how do you how do you sort of deal with those challenges from an artistic, creative point of view? Um, I guess that's part of you know it's part of yeah modern day world, modern day life. It's that people will want a whole book designed, but they won't have any text or any images. That's just it's kind of normal now. And obviously, you can only go so far because you really need the whole content. And, and obviously, inevitably, with any book or program or anything, it's not just art, it's anything, you won't have that. Because A, it hasn't either been done, it hasn't been written, or it hasn't been decided, or had the people haven't been selected. And that's just, it's, it's kind of... So you are sometimes a bit blind. And I think it is quite difficult. I suppose it's people always not confirming everything. So everyone's in a whole world of... of uh, limbo but I think you just have to kind of I suppose our approach is you just got to kind of get on with something and get a reaction back so you just sort of ping 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 ideas across uh, and they can be quite I guess I'm I'm kind of very much into this thing of just like chucking something over and seeing what people think and usually people kind of get a reaction uh, straight away you know, usually you want to get that um, very quick reaction, you know, I love it or I hate it. I think when we, when we threw that kaleidoscope, those patterns over, when we got, the, got to a point, we sent them to Paul, and I think he just sent some emojis, uh, happy cla uh, clappy hands, five clappy hands. <laughs> and that's kind of, that's, that's good, right? That means, yeah, clappy hands. It's positive. And, uh, and apart from the Love is Enough leggings, which you never got to create, yeah. unfortunately, um, <laughs> what would be the next goal then? Well, I, I, I um, you know, I've always been, I suppose, what, what, what used to happen, say, in the 70s, 60s and 70s, you used to get small design outfits, say, for example, they weren't that small, but they were design outfits, say, in, in their examples in England and Holland. The total design, I suppose it wasn't that much of a small outfit, but it was a relatively small outfit run by Vim Crow, and he was a designer like me. And he would do, you know, uh, uh, Amro ba uh, Rabo Bank, which was a huge bank in Holland, or he would do KLM. So he would do, or he would do like uh, money. And I think 
and it's quite sad that the opportunity for creative graphic designers really is, is you know, when I talk to any student, they come and talk to me and they say, oh, I want to do art books. I'm like, well, why do you want to do art books? Surely you want to do, like, work for something more uh, kind of mainstream. Uh, but really it's like that's, you know, when I was young, it was always like, I want to do record covers. I want to be Peter Saville, who was a brilliant graphic, who still is a brilliant graphic designer in the UK, you know, New Order and all factory records and all that kind of stuff. Uh, whereas now, I suppose records has been um, kind of like homogenized into kind of, kind of uh, sort of thing that graphic designers never get. You know, we, got, we, we recently got the chance to do quite a big album for someone and it was kind of quite, quite exciting to be back in that world of doing like a record cover or in that world. And, and I'd like to do some more stuff like that. I'd love to rebrand HSBC or McDonald's. I think it would be amazing to see what would happen if, if you got that opportunity. And I guess getting that opportunity is, is now difficult because that's all gone into this world of, sort of branding agencies, which really didn't exist before, which is this, you know, you could say it's, it's, it's good or not good, but in a way, People like me are not in that world, but I'd like to get into that world. Why not? I think I could do quite a good job of rebranding, I don't know, anything. Labour Party or <laughs> <laughs> Conservative Party or I don't know. I think, yeah, Europe or, you know, create a brand for the world or something. I don't know. Like, why not? Why, why only do... Um, you know, ultimately, what, what we're doing is we're packaging something. So we are, as designers, we are, you know, or I am, or we are, able to, to think, okay, we could package, you know, a curry house, or we could package um, uh, an airline, or we could package uh, a mobile phone company. It's, it's still got to have some visual thing going on. And, and that's all to do with a feeling. It's an emotion, right? So, you know, when you look at Apple, you get a feeling, you, you think of something, don't you? When you think about Apple, you think of good design or you think of high quality. But really, there's not much different. You just sort of feel that by the way that the interface is designed and the typography that they use because Steve Jobs went to uh, a lecture, didn't he? About Have you heard the speech he gave about typography? He went to a typography class in the summer and that's when he decided that he wanted to make a computer that was beautiful and that would would have good typography so he changed quite a lot just with that that kind of one moment of wanting good design you have uh, interesting clients both yeah. artists or um, galleries, so, well, yeah. but if you are a client is something dry or boring or academic, yeah. you still approach as uh, nearly boring. Well, you know, we do, we do, you know, we, a lot of design, you know, is, is not a compromise, but is a, is a journey and you do have to, like, a client will know how they want to be portrayed often more than you. So you might think you know, oh, well, they need to look like that. But actually, they know. And if they don't like something, they can just say, I don't like it. You know, and, and, and you have to kind of accept that. Or you, you, what, I ha what I try and do is not accept that. I try and work out why they don't like it. So it's like, do they like it? Do they not like it? Or is it not working for them because it's bad? Or is it just the way that it's presented? Or is it just the color? We've often done things and a client's gone, I hate it, I hate it so much, and I hate you. And you try and work out why, and they're like, because I support Man United, and you've done it in blue, and that's Man City. People do that, I'm not joking. We've done logos that are in a color, and because of an association with something, it really can put people off. So it's like playing color is a, is a very powerful thing. Um, and colors do certain things. You know, blue is always a very much a safe color. So if you look at a lot of logos in the world or 
safe things, that blue is always a colour that will be used because it's kind of safe. People think they're safe when it's blue. Whereas bright pink or bright yellow, it's sort of a bit more edgy. So, you know, I think your, your question about, um, yeah, how you deal with people that, that maybe are, well, you're, you're saying, how do you deal with people that are maybe less, what, less creative? No. Well, in, um, whether still, yeah, boring still works. Yeah, 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 make it really boring. Yeah, we actually did a job, we actually did a job recently for, I wouldn't say, it wasn't boring, but it was, a, it was quite a mainstream publisher, I think it was Routledge, and it was a, quite an academic book about, uh, it was called Craft of Use, so it was about kind of, it was a little bit about, it was about upcycling and recycling clothes, but it was a very dry, serious text, and they sent uh, a list of the typefaces we could use, and they say, you can only use these fonts. So I was in a straitjacket. I was like, oh my God, this is going to be so boring because I can only use 20 fonts and I can't do anything. I'm just, I'm strang you know, I'm, I'm chained up. Um, but our reaction, my reaction was, well, let's just use all of them. So we used all of them and made this crazy font where we just used all of them and they absolutely loved it. And they even wrote it into the book why we're using this font. So, you know, you can, I think with, I think there's always, there's always a negativity to say, oh, if something's not going to be that exciting, there's always something exciting, even if something's not exciting. That can actually be more exciting to sort of try and get that shift going on. Because actually, if you get a brief and people say, hey, it's really cool and wacky, do whatever you want, that's actually not that exciting. you don't really know what to do. Whereas if you say, here are the constraints, you can't do that, you can't do that, you can't do that, you can then try and figure out something to do within those constraints or find something interesting that you can put into that design. That's what I wanted to say about the London Transport. I mean, how did they react? Because it looks very... Boring. <laughs> Well, I love it because I think it's what you said. It really captures your eye, and it does what it's. It, it was really interesting, and when everyone's trying to do loads of pattern and get your catcher attention, it worked in the opposite way, yeah. and it really did. But I mean, what I mean is, how do you convince London Transport, or were they okay and like, yeah, we love it, or did they think? Well, we did do lots of lots of versions where we did tr do try to design it, but the, you know, one thing I maybe didn't explain is that the text came from Anna at Barrable. And they were the uh, found uh, text or messages or words on the back of photographs. So they were captions to photographs. So in a way, she wanted them to be quite sort of invisible. It was almost like she probably wanted the, the whole thing to be the design not to have any personality. Uh, sort of super stripped back. And... You know, what I obviously love about London Underground is the font. The font, you know, Johnson, which is 100 years old this year, one of the first ever corporate design font, commissioned font, uh, designed by Edward Johnson. Um, what I love about that is, is if you just use that, it works so well. You almost don't have to do anything else because they've got such a good font. So actually, it's almost like a gift and the commas were like claws because he, he drew it with calligraphy. Uh, the, 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 the dot is like a, a diamond, if you look at the dot in Johnson, um, because he, he, he did the sort of 45 degree calligraphy thing. So you, I, I, I just knew I had something really great to work with, so why cover it up with design? Whereas something like maybe the kaleidoscope job is actually you do need something to cover up stuff with. Mm. Otherwise you've got nothing. So like you have to think about that as you sort of like when you start a project of what do they actually need. It's difficult. It's difficult. And it's difficult. Yeah. It can be really difficult. 
question, but just first, maybe, so the playfulness of what you've done in terms of kind of deconstructing um, typography and sort of testing the limits of what you can read, what you can't read. It, it reminded me of something that I saw a few years ago, um, an artist called Lucy Skier, who um, had this yeah. sort of uh, Van Gogh style chair, and she, she sort of dipped it in paint and made kind of an alphabet from this chair, sort of four legs on the ground or the back of it, the side of it, and it, it sort of reminded me of the way she kind of used that object to make sort of a, a language and sort of a, you know, a, yeah, it just, uh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I think Sol Lewitt did an alphabet based on his kind of impossible structures, these sort of chairs and, you know, I think I, I always used to be quite anti, like, you know, people making letters out of spaghetti and, you know, people what you think like typography was like making, you know, uh, I don't know, typeface out of string or like chairs or hair or, and I used to think it was really rubbish and now I really love it because it's sort of really expressive. And I think if you do it in a really good way, it can look amazing. Uh, you know, it's like spaghetti hoop lettering, I think is, is really brilliant. Or sausage typefaces, they're great. There's always a place. <laughs> typefaces made out of cheese or, you know, there's always a place. And it's knowing when to use that. Or uh, it's also how you do it, I think. You know, it's like any, you know, you could always, you could make a typeface out of a chair, and I could make a typeface out of a chair. It's like, but they'd be very different. No, I can see B in the wrong. Okay, yeah, that's not intentional, but if it's there for long enough, then you can start to see all sorts of things. It's not supposed to be a B, but if you want it to be a B, it can be a B for bubble. Or for bum. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Okay. Thanks very much. Thank you very much. You're welcome. It's a pleasure.